Well, this is what I had prepared for last week. And, um, you know, the, the weather forecast was for another uh, flood to come and, you know, to keep us having the board two by two. We just canceled services. And so, um, so we'll pick up where we left off last time in Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 12 through 29. And that's what we're looking at tonight. And I titled the study tonight, The Danger of Religion. You know, one of the things that is important for us to understand is that religion is different than being a Christian. Christianity is a relationship with Jesus. Now, our religion is what we practice as a result of that relationship. But you can practice a religion and not have a relationship. You, you can have religion and not be a Christian. You can call yourself a Christian and not be a Christian. There are many, many religious people in the world. In fact, I heard a study just the other day that demographically around the world, the world is becoming more and more religious. Now, you would look at our world and our culture in the United States and think it's becoming less religious. But globally, the world is becoming more religious. The sad thing is, is that Christianity is not growing as fast as some other religions are growing. In fact, by the year 2050, the largest religion in the world is projected to be Islam. And it's just largely because of birth rates. <coughs> um, Muslims have more babies than non-Muslims, and typically the, 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 the leading factor to whether you're going to practice your religion or not is what your parents were. And that's not always a guarantee. Maybe you've heard this or not, I don't know if you have or not, but there was a, uh, a gentleman who uh, went into a Baptist church one day. Um, the preacher was saying, I, I'm a Baptist born, burped and bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. The gentleman waved, raised his hand and said, said uh, why are you a Baptist? He said, uh, well, my, my daddy was a Baptist. Well, why was your daddy a Baptist? Well, my granddaddy was a Baptist. He said, um, well, I'm a Methodist, and I'm a Methodist because my daddy was a Methodist and my granddaddy was a Methodist. And he said, so, so what would happen if your daddy was a, an idiot? And your granddaddy was an idiot. What would that make you if the Baptist preacher said a Methodist? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can add that off the tape, Wayne, if you need to. <laughs> but that's the difference between religion and a relationship. Just last year, a study was done um, of Americans uh, about what they believed about certain things. And this is some of the statistics that were very uh, alarming to me. Uh, the first one was that 74% of Americans, 74% of Americans, believe that God only punishes the most serious sins. That not all sins are punished, only the most serious ones. 74% believe that 64% of Americans, and this is our, all, an overwhelming majority, 64% of Americans believe that God accepts the worship of all religions. Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, etc., that God's pleased with worship as long as you're worshiping something. This one was very disturbing to me. 64% of evangelical Christians, of which we would be considered evangelical, 64% of evangelical Christians believe that heaven is is a place where all people go. Regardless of your relationship with Jesus. 64% of American evangelicals believe that. 77% of Americans believe that God requires our help in bringing about salvation. That we have to contribute something to it. 77% of Americans believe that. Now, there were other statistics, one of them that was very alarming, I don't have the exact figure, but it was a pretty large uh, percentage of that, uh, when it came to specific beliefs, believed that, uh, that the Holy Spirit was an impersonal force, kind of like the force in Star Wars, not an actual person. The Holy Spirit's not some kind of weird spirit. I, I, I had a, a teenager come to me one time, and, and he thought he had figured the Trinity out. He said, I, I have got it figured out. He said, you've got God the Father, you've got God the Son, the Holy Spirit is the ghost of Jesus. That's what he, he, he thought he had figured out the training. I said, no, no, you're way off base. If that's what you think, it's 
three persons, one God. Um, it's a mystery. We can't really fully grasp it. But these beliefs that people have are so off sometimes. And people who sit in churches week in after week out, who we think are grounded theologically, are, are really holding to some pretty dangerous beliefs. And in fact, our behavior, I think, demonstrates just how dangerous some of these uh, beliefs are. Um, and the problem is, is that we tend to buy the belief that religion is enough. And the danger that a lot of people face is, is they believe they just need just enough religion not to feel guilty about stuff. You know what I'm saying? You know, they, maybe, maybe their life's not going like they think it ought to. Maybe things aren't as they should, so they start going to church. They start feeling better about themselves. They start feeling like things are going a little bit better. And that goes on for a little while, and then they, things start kind of plateauing and maybe going south a little bit in their life. Things are, so they say, well, you know what? Maybe I can start reading my Bible or giving a little bit more. They start doing this stuff to make themselves feel good. And they do these things as a way to try to, uh, to, to assuage what guilt they may feel about what they've done in their life. Thinking if they just do enough, eventually they'll feel better. That's not a recent development. That's been going on for thousands of years. And Paul, I think, is dealing with that here in Romans 2, verses 2 to 29. So let's read those uh, verses right now. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not for man, but for God. That may seem kind of strange, what Paul's getting at, but he's building an argument that he started in chapter 1. Basically what Paul is doing from here through the middle of chapter 3 is he's laying a prosecutorial case against all people. He's basically saying everybody's a sinner. Gentile and Jew, you're all a sinner. None of you are able to save yourself. And he's addressing here the danger of religion. That religion can give this sense of false assurance that because you're religious, you're okay. Because you're moral, you're okay. Because you're a quote-unquote good person, you're okay. And there's four dangers uh, that I want us to see tonight in what Paul's talking about here. The first is the danger of self-judgment. The danger of self-judgment. This is placing uh, yourself um, in the position of both the judge for yourself. So, you know, you're, you're looking at your life and you're basically saying, oh, I'm not that bad. And, and particularly when it comes to the issue of what you are ignorant about. The question that is driving this is where Paul begins there when he says, why would, you know, the question is basically, why would God hold those accountable who don't have the law? You know, if you don't know it's wrong, how can you be held accountable for it? That, that would be the argument. It would almost be like if, 
if you're driving through a town and you get pulled over for speeding and there's no speeding, speed limit signs, are you guilty of speeding even if you don't know what's speeding? Now, that's the question. Now, before you jump to the conclusion, because some of you say, well, of course not. If you don't, if you don't know what's speeding, it's not speeding. That's self-judgment, right? Because you're assuming a standard for yourself that's different than the standard for everybody else. You're assuming that because you don't know, that because you, 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 you're ignorant of something, therefore you have to be held to a different standard than those who are knowledgeable. And Paul argues you can't do that. Um, the answer that he gives there is that even those who don't have the law have some sense of the law because... There is an innate knowledge, even though it's corrupted by sin, an innate knowledge of a basic sense of right and wrong. Um, you go across the world, you will find some commonality amongst all people about certain things. Now, that, the application of it may be different, the punishment for it may be different, but, but in some, sem some semblance, every human being all over the planet has some sense of right and wrong. It's limited, it's not sufficient on, on its own, but there is a semblance of that in all people. And that's what Paul's getting at there when he says there in verse 14, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. So, example, thou shalt not kill. Was it sinful to kill before God gave that law? Yes. Okay? It was wrong. Why was it wrong? God hadn't said it was wrong at that point. Why was it wrong for Cain to kill Abel? God hadn't said it was wrong at that point. Why was it wrong? But God hadn't said he couldn't. So why was it wrong? It, it was wrong because God didn't just invent a law. God's law is universal. It is outside of time. It's not something that comes along and says, well, you know, they, they did a lot of murders. I think I should make that against the law now. It's always been wrong because God has always believed and said it was wrong, even if God hadn't explicitly stated so. We humans are made in the image of God. Even though we're corrupted by sin, there's still some element of us knowing Certain things are wrong. And you'll find people who say, well, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. It's all relative. It's all subjective. It's all based on your upbringing and your culture. I love what C.S. Lewis says, writing in the middle of World War II. He says, whenever you find a man who says he does not believe in a real right and wrong, you will find the same man going on, going on this a moment later. He may break his promise to you, but if you try breaking one to him... He'll be complaining it's not fair before you can say Jack Robinson. A nation may say treaties don't matter, but then the next minute they spoil their case by saying the particular treaty they want to break was an unfair one. But if treaties do not matter, and if there is no such thing as right and wrong, in other words, if there is no law of nature, what is the difference between a fair treaty and an unfair one? You know, you, you, you can justify a lot of things if you really want to. The point is... You may say that it's perfectly okay for somebody who's starving to steal bread. You know, when I was in school, we took ethics. That was one of the dilemmas we had to work through. You know, the man who steals bread to feed his family, is, is he guilty? And, and, and the question that was always raised is, what if you're the baker that he steals the bread from? You may justify what he's doing as a noble thing, but if you're the one who's, uh, who's it's not against, then it becomes a problem. It becomes wrong. So there's this innate sense of right and wrong. Having the law does not provide a special status. Having the law does not, does not make you more or less guilty. It doesn't provide a special status with God. See, you could take the argument from one extreme to the other. And basically, you could make the argument that if people are only guilty when they know it's wrong, the worst thing we could ever do is tell them they're wrong. I've heard people use this passage of Scripture to justify that people are saved apart from Jesus. This is the argument I've heard used. I'll agree with it. 
that they are saved apart from Jesus if they've never heard about Jesus. If that's the case, the worst thing we could ever do is evangelism. Think about it. If your ignorance is enough to save you, then our telling you about Jesus condemns you. So why would we go to hell if that was the case? So that kind of defeats the purpose. Having the law provides no special status. All will be judged because God shows no partiality. All fall short whether we have the law or not. Because the standard is the same whether we know the standard or not. The standard doesn't change because the standard is set by God. The danger we have to avoid, and this is what I think Paul is driving home to his audience here, the danger we have to avoid is basing our acceptance before God on a comparison with other people. We are really bad at this. Or good at it, depending on how you look at it. Okay? We, we like to base our acceptance before God on comparing ourselves with how good or bad we perceive other people to be. We have to avoid that. Now, one of the things that we tend to do, unintentionally, but we are guilty of this, is we tend to say, oh, those poor ignorant people, they don't know any better. They don't know that's wrong, and there they are over there just being so blissfully ignorant in their sinfulness. How wonderful it is for me that I know better than to do that. That's a dangerous place to be, because then what we're saying is, because we have knowledge, because we know better, God's pleased with us. Because of that knowledge, that's not why God's pleased with us. God's acceptance of us is not based on our comparison with other people. Remember this, that a blind person can't help what they can't see. But that doesn't mean they won't fall into a hole if they come upon one. There was a guy when I was in college, he was blind, and he navigated campus with a with a, with a staff, and at Christmas one year, the, the, the campus thought they'd be really uh, festive, and they took the, the flagpole in the middle of the quad, and they, they, they ran lights down along around the edge of the sidewalk to make this really pretty tree at night from, from that. The problem is that they, they blocked the sidewalk. Well, if you could see, you could tell. Well, they didn't tell with the poor guy that was blind that he couldn't go that way anymore, and his stick didn't catch those things, and he walked right into it one day. He couldn't help it, he couldn't see it. That didn't mean he didn't get hurt when he ran into it. Just because somebody doesn't know what they're doing is wrong doesn't make it okay. We have to be careful not to compare ourselves to other people. See, it's dangerous in two ways. One, it grounds our definition of sin only in action not in the condition of the heart. We have to, be, have to be very careful that we don't make sin just about what you do or don't do. Jesus is very clear in the Sermon on the Mount that sin is not just action, it's the condition of the heart. You know, he says, you've heard that it was said, don't murder. I say to you, don't be angry with your brother. Well, how do you know if you're angry? It's an internal thing. <coughs> You've heard that it was said to not commit adultery, but I say to you, anyone who's looked lustfully upon a woman has committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, if it's just about action, if it's just about what we do, then, then we can compare ourselves to other people and kind of have a checklist and say, well, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. We forget that it's about the internal character of the heart. The actions are just the fruit of what's on the inside. Our actions are determinative by the condition of our heart. So it grounds our definition of sin in action as opposed to including the heart. But also it's natural because it assigns an apparent value to sin on our perception of the severity of that sin. Watch the news or not, but there have been a lot of tragic things going on in our world the last few weeks. And, 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 and you look at some of the things in the countries around the world and you think, why would somebody do that? Why would somebody just, just blow up a building? Or why would somebody just murder people randomly? Why would people do that? We, we look at those, those are somehow worse sins than what we do, and they're not. 
If we base our performance and our acceptance on our performance by how we do compared to other people, then we'll start doing that. We'll start saying, well, th those are really bad sins, but what I do, it's not so bad. Yeah, I, I have pride, but it's not so bad. You know, or, or I'm a gossip, it's not so bad. Or I, or, I have a, or I have a lying tongue, that's not so bad. At least I'm not killing people. At least I'm not, you know, we do that, and that creates this comparison of severity, which is dangerous when it comes to sin. To the danger of self-judgment. The second danger is the danger of overconfidence. The danger of overconfidence. That's what we see there beginning in verse 17. If you call yourself a Jew, what they were doing at that point was they were basing their acceptance on their pedigree. Where they came from. You know, the, the, the early church consisted of Jews and Gentiles, mixed churches in a lot of the big cities. And what you have is you have a division that develops in the churches between those who were raised a Jew and therefore more religious in their upbringing, more observant, probably more moral, and those who were raised Gentile, which means they were probably idol worshippers at some point. And so when those Gentiles come in, you know their, their level of learning is, is not good. They've not learned as much as the Jews have. And so, so these Jewish Christians, they may go around saying, you know, we're better because we had this Jewish experience. This is, I was explaining it one time. Let's say that you are as good morally as you can be before you become a Christian. And if 10, if, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, if moral perfection is a 10, and you're as good morally as you can be. So let's say you start off at like a three. You know, you're still dead for sins, but you, you, you've learned some things before you become a Christian, so you're pretty good morally. So let's say that's where you start off at a three. And you have spent years as a Christian, and God's worked in you, and God's taken care of some of the rough parts of your life. And after 30 years of being a Christian, you have gone from a three to a four. <clears throat> You were pretty good morally before, and you're a little bit better. Still not perfect. Nobody gets to 10. But you went from a 3 to a 4. Now let's say that somebody who has had no you know, background in Christianity, has no moral basis, complete and total wild pagan lifestyle before they become a Christian, they start off at a 1. And after 30 years of God working and working and working and working on them, they're at a 3. In theory, God has done more in their life, getting them from a 1 to a 3, than he did in your life, getting you from a 3 to a 4, but after 30 years, that is where you started. So it's very easy for people who have that kind of pedigree to say, oh, I'm just so much better because I had a better background. I, I, I'm a Jew. We can put that in contemporary language and say, oh, you know, I grew up in church. I, I, I knew all this stuff growing up. You know, one of the things, and I grew up in church, one of the things that just amazes me is just how much we take for granted. I, 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 have, I have just been amazed when I talk to new Christians how little some of them actually know. And we were once that ignorant too. But we just assume because we've been a certain way for so long that, we, we are, we, that everybody should know these things, and it's not the case. So they were basing their acceptance in the fact that they were Jew. They were overconfident in that. They were right, relying on their possession of the law, he says. You know, in other words, they have the law, therefore they're God's favored chosen people. God chose to give the law through them, therefore they're better than other people. That was the, the idea that some of them probably were having at the time. And there's some even today that will say that the Jews are God's chosen people and therefore don't need to come to Jesus. There's a lot of people who believe that. Who believe that the Jews don't need Jesus because God wants to save them because they're Jewish. That breaks the point here of what Paul's saying. They were boasting of God. Now that doesn't sound like a bad thing. We should boast of what God has done in our lives, but we must be very careful not to see that work as a reason to think we're better than other people. The good example of that scripture is the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You may be familiar with it. The Pharisee and Titus would go to the temple to pray. The Pharisee says, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other people. He lists all the stuff. He's thanking God, which sounds like a 
a good thing to do for how good he is. He's basing his acceptance on how good he is by what God's done in his life. He's thanking God for it, but he's boasting in God incorrectly. There's pride that comes from knowing God's will. Knowing God's standards. Not a bad thing. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge, however, is. There's a lot of people, they love theology. They love to study the Bible. They love to know things about the Bible. They really don't love God. How much you ever met one of those? I've met some of those. They are very smart, very knowledgeable people. They think they've got all figured. They're the classic example of like a Pharisee. You know, they, they, they will dot every I and cross every T. They won't miss anything. They are theologically astute. But don't let God surprise them. Because then they get all been out of shape. Then you had the discerning, and he says there one of the things that they were doing is discerning, approving of what is excellent. They were making moral judgment because they knew they had this knowledge. It was causing overconfidence. And they were confident that they would be instructed in the law. Yeah, maybe you don't realize that there would be a lot of theologically sound, smart people in England. You realize that, right? There would be a lot of people that could pass theology exams better than any of us, and they will go to hell. Because it's not about what you know, it's who you know. It's not about how much of the Bible you know, but do you know Jesus. It is overconfidence that you can sometimes develop leads to hypocrisy. When we base our confidence on what we do, or at least what people think about us, that's really what it's about, what people think about us, then we begin to live a double life. When this happens, we begin to sanctify our sinfulness. You know how we do that? Well, if this is all that I do, if this is the only sin I commit, you know, I'm sinning so that God's grace can be seen in my life. I've heard somebody say that to me once before. I said, preacher, I, I, I'm not going to stop doing this because I want God to so supernaturally interfere, intervene in my life that it has to be a God thing to do it. And I'm thinking, you're an idiot. I didn't say that. <laughs> and then I had to repent of thinking that. <laughs> But this overconfidence can lead to hypocrisy. And hypocrisy ultimately damages our witness for Christ. And there's a lot of things that we can do, that we are free as Christians to do, that does not mean we should do. You, know, you understand there's a difference there. There are things that it is not sinful to do them. God doesn't condemn them. God doesn't say, thou shalt not. It's not explicitly condemned in Scripture. It is okay. But yet there are certain things we should not do because it could damage our witness for Christ if we do. We have to be very careful. And I'm not going to say any specific thing because it could vary from circumstance to circumstance. It could differ from place to place. Uh, and just to give an example, there are some parts of the world... Where, um, if, you, if we were in a room like this in a Baptist church and having dinner, there would not be sweet tea on the table, there would be wine on the table. And if you didn't partake, it would be considered very offensive. Yet, we had the Lord's Supper on Sunday, and unless there was a miracle from the time we made the cup to the time we served it, it was just Welch's grape juice. Okay? And, and, you know, a little tidbit of history, in case you were wondering, grape juice, as a store purchasable item, has only been around since the mid-1800s and was developed and invented by a Methodist preacher so that he could give communion to people who had problems with alcohol without them actually having to consume alcohol. The um, church I was a youth minister at was founded in 1789. And uh, the first pastor of that church was actually censured twice by the con congregation of the church for being drunk in the pulpit. And at one point, the church actually split over whether the pastor could have a steal to supplement his income or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, things, things differ as time progresses. So I'm just saying, you know, in general... 
Um, there, there are issues that you know, are witness for Christ. We have to be very careful about. Here's something to think about. Brennan Manning said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Those who acknowledge Jesus with their lips walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. You claim to know Jesus, but you don't live like it. You know, there's certain things it's not simple to do, but there's certain things that, that people look at Christians and say, Christians ought not do that. Sometimes we have to love our lost brothers and sisters enough to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that out of love for you. Hypocrisy damages our witness for Christ. Unrepentant hypocrisy leads ultimately unrepentant hypocrisy. Catch that we're all hypocritical at times, but unrepentant, that's when you know it's hypocrisy and you choose not to repent of it, eventually leads to a fancy theological word called apostasy. Apostasy. Apostasy is not losing your salvation. Some people will say that it is. Apostasy is walking away from what you claim to believe, thereby proving you were never converted to begin with. There's a difference. Okay? Here's two scriptures to help prove that point. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. These are people who claim to be Christians, who claim to have faith in Jesus, but they, they quote-unquote, fell away. It wasn't that they were Christians one day and not Christians. They were never converted to begin with. Jesus himself said, the one who endures to the end will be saved. So how can you know if somebody's a true believer or not? If they stay one. If they stay if they endure to the end. That's what it is. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, we make it clear what the gospel is. We tell people they need to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus. And we pray the Holy Spirit works that work in their lives to bring them to that place of, of trusting in Christ and faith in Christ. But we are very clever people and we can deceive ourselves. We can make ourselves think that we've done something that we've really not. And this overconfidence can cause that to happen. Thirdly, the danger of false security. The danger of false security. This is what all the circumcision language is about. Circumcision, Jewish circumcision, was the mark of the covenant given by God to Abraham that all of his descendants were to be circumcised. This was a major issue in the first century. Should Christians be circumcised? If you were Jewish and you became a Christian and you were a man, there was no issue because you would have been circumcised when you were eight days old. But if you were a Gentile, you would not have been circumcised. So the question then becomes, do these Gentile men who profess faith in Christ have to be circumcised? There are those who would say they have to. And their argument was, God gave that as a sign of the covenant to Abraham. Jesus was circumcised. All the disciples were circumcised. Therefore, be circumcised. Paul argues, no, circumcision is not what matters. The question becomes, what is of greater value? The outward symbol, circumcision, or the inward heart? What's of greater value? Paul would argue that obedience is is always of greater value. Notice what he says there. Verse 27. Or verse 26, I should say. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, so in other words, he's not, he's not circumcised, but he obeys the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So what's he talking about there? That he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision, but break the law. In other words, living out circumcision, living out what circumcision was all about, was about a relationship with God, that God gave to Abraham, the sign of the relationship that God had with Abraham, and Abraham to sit in front of God. Living that out 
is a result of the inward change of the heart, not what a knife does. Circumcision is just a physical act. It does not change a person's heart. The argument here in Romans and in other places in the New Testament and in Scripture as a whole too is that what you have in circumcision is not you know, this act is what makes you right with God. It's that the inward change of your heart is what makes you right with God. Circumcision is just a sign of something that God has told. So the false security is what we often find people basing their confidence in. Things like religious affiliation. You know, well, I'm a member of that church. There are no church roles in heaven. You know that? Not more. And God's not going to ask us, now who, now, now, was he on your church role? You know, God's not going to ask that question. Now church, I, I believe very strongly church membership is biblical. I think there's biblical evidence for it. I think it's something that we should practice and practice well. But it's not a salvation issue. Baptism. I believe very strongly that if you are somebody who professes faith in Jesus Christ and you are physically able to be baptized, you ought to be. To not be baptized is an act of disobedience to something Jesus has commanded, which is sin. Therefore, you're living in sin. Okay. So you should want to be baptized if you, are, if you are professing faith in Jesus Christ. You should want to be baptized. But your baptism does not save you. Baptism is not something that does something to you. It's a sign of what's already happened to you. It's a post-event, not a pre-event. I, I did a funeral for a guy, and his family was very sincere on wanting to put his baptism certificate in his casket as proof that he was a Christian. Um, yeah, I mean, you know. Don't get me started on putting stuff in people's caskets. That's, that's another issue I have. Um, but the point is, is that it was, people, sometimes people base, you know, their acceptance before God on the fact, well, I was baptized when I was seven years old. I may have lived like a booger since then, but I was baptized when I was seven years old. Okay? Or your family religious history. I can't tell you how many people I've met in my lifetime that as soon as I tell them I'm a pastor, the first words out of their mouth, no matter what we were talking about, the first words out of their mouth were, well, my grandmama was a real good Christian. <laughs> you know, God has no grandchildren, only children. It don't matter if your mama or daddy were the best Christian who's ever walked the face of the earth. As an individual, you are on your own when it comes before God. Where do we place our security? The heart matters above all else. An obedient heart always, always, always trumps uncircumcision. Always. An obedient heart always trumps uncircumcision. What matters is, is your obedience. Here, here are some, some other scriptures. These are Old Testament scriptures to kind of prove this is not a new idea. Jeremiah 4.4 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. It's about circumcision of the heart. It's about obedience. It's about living in a relationship. It's not about the act of circumcision itself. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, we'll even further back. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul that you may live. And God is going to do the work in your heart. It's an internal thing. Now, hear this passage from Ezekiel 33 and, 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 and ask yourself if this does not sound like some of what goes on in our world today, in our Christian world today. As for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to his brother, Come, and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. 
For with lustful talk in their mouths they act, for their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. When this comes, and come it will, then they will know what a prophet, a prophet has been among them. You hear what is going on there? They're, they're, going, they're going to hear the word of the Lord and say, oh, this is wonderful. This is great. We've never heard anything like this before. It's so good. And they go about living their life as if nothing changed. We live in a world where that, unfortunately, tends to be the case. People sit in pew Sunday after Sunday. They flood churches because they, they're interested in what they're hearing. And then they at least feign some interest in what they're hearing. And yet when it comes down to it, when it comes down to the heart of the matter, it makes no difference in their lives because they don't let it penetrate their hearts. They don't let it change the condition of their lives because they don't let it hit them where it really matters, which is their heart. And when it begins to penetrate the heart, it begins to hurt. Because it begins to reveal some things that we're not comfortable with. Where we're going to put our confidence you know, because, oh, I, you know, I, I go to this church, I listen to this preacher, he's really good, you know. God don't care good about that. All God cares about is what's on the inside of your heart, and your relationship with him. Don't put your confidence in other stuff, because it doesn't matter. What you do only matters if it is the result of what's inside. You can be the best church member ever and still be lost. You know, the Pharisees would have made perfect church members. Think about it. They knew the Bible. They tithed. That's enough to, you know, get a lot of churches excited. Okay? They went regularly. They were up for helping do anything and they lost. You can be the best church in the world and die in the middle. It's about what's on the inside that matters. And then lastly, the, the fourth danger of religion is the danger of misdirected praise. It's the very last verse there. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not for man, but for God. The danger of legalistic religion is that it leads us to seek the approval of others by our actions. How many times have you done something or not done something because of what somebody else would say? Think about that. How many times have you done something so, so somebody would notice that you did it and pat you on the back for doing it? How many times have you not done something because you were concerned about what somebody might say to you about what you did? See, when we become more concerned about what other people think of us, we begin to shift our focus away from what God says to what everybody else thinks. We, we can be very, very happy pleasing people. You know, a lot of people think people pleasers are unhappy. People pleasers can be very happy. The problem is when we allow people pleasing to become our focus. Well, I gotta do this so somebody so this person will be mad. I gotta do this so that this person will be, be happy with me. I gotta do this so that and we forget that it's not about what we please the people, it's about what we do for God. This is hard for preachers. We, we like people like us. I don't know any pastor, unless some are kind of sick in the head, that don't want people to like them. Every pastor wants people to like them. And it's really bad in churches like in Baptist Church where you vote on the preacher. I, I, there's one denomination, and they won't even go unnamed, but I know of one denomination that they actually vote on their pastor annually. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> okay. They vote on their pastor annually. So the end of July, 
The church votes. And if it's not a high enough percentage, the pastor's gone. Now think about this. And just put yourself in that pastor's position for a second. Let's say one year you got 95%. It should be a pretty good percentage. And the next year you get 90%. It's still a pretty good percentage. But I guarantee you for weeks, you're thinking, who's that 5%? <laughs> you know? And then you start dwelling on that. You start thinking, why? Well, next year, if I go even further, I'm moving the wrong direction. And what happens is we begin pleasing people more than we worry about pleasing God. And here's why that matters. You cannot serve two masters. You'll either hate one or you'll hate the other, but you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and people. It's not doable. Can't do it. And, and the thing is, is that if you're doing what God wants you to do, there will be times you will make people angry at you. They will not like you. <clears throat> but if you please God, then nothing else matters. At the end of the day, when you stand before God, God's not going to say, Man, how, many, how many people did you please on this day? He's going to look at you and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Or he's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity, I do you not. He's not going to be concerned about who you pleased. Now that's not an excuse to be a jerk. I just want to put that out there. But it is freedom to not have to live with misdirected praise, to worry about what other people are saying about you or thinking about you so that, you know, you're, you're constantly on this weight of, am I doing enough? Am I happy with me? Or instead, you're saying, okay, God, am I pleasing you? Because that's all that matters. And that's why religion can be dangerous, because religion ultimately is people focused. It's about what you do. Christianity is about what God has done. You take all the other religions of the world, every other one of them, <coughs> They all say the same thing, ultimately. You have to do certain things, and if you do enough of them, hopefully, it'll end well. Whatever that ending is for them, whether it's punishment, reward, or reincarnation, whatever that religion teaches, if you do good enough, it'll end well for you. Christianity says you couldn't do well enough. You could, you could never be good enough. So God <coughs> became... A man. And died for you. The most horrific death imaginable. <clears throat> and when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Not, I've done my part, now you do your part. <coughs> it is done. All of it. We don't have to do it. Because if, if, if 1% depended on me and 99% depended on God, I'd mess up not 1%. And that's just how we are. It's all about what God has done for us. And that's why it's a relationship and not a religion in the sense of what we do. Does that make sense? Clear as money creek water? <laughs> all right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the hope that we have because of what you have done in bringing us to you. That we don't have to seek the approval of others. We don't have to try to earn our acceptance, but we just trust in you. Father, help us when we struggle with that, when we struggle in trying to please other people, and when we struggle in trying to to earn the approval of other human beings. When we compare ourselves to other people, Father, just help us to look to you, to live for you, and to seek what you would want above all else. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.